in the British Telecom PLC and Her Majesty's Treasury and another. My Lords, my Lady, um, we have done a little homework overnight as, as requested. Uh, there are two documents that the court should have. The first is a little clip which is a note on the involvement of members and trade unions. And this explains the efforts that were made to notify individual pension scheme members and their representatives who were potentially affected by these proceedings. <coughs> and as the court can see, uh, an order was made by Mr Justice Oosley requiring BT to give notice of the proceedings to those potentially affected. And we served uh, 8,500 members of the pension scheme in response to that direction. You can see uh, a summary of the letter is set out in paragraph 3. Thank you. And 170 people requested the claim form and statement of facts and grounds in response to that. Uh, the trustee then served a large number of uh, additional people. In fact, a total of almost 80,000 members of the pension scheme were ultimately uh, given notice of these proceedings. Uh, only one uh, sought to intervene, as you can see it, uh, paragraph 8, and it turned out that she was in fact somebody who wasn't affected by the decision because she had reached the pension age in 2017. There was a separately notification given to two relevant trade unions, <coughs> the Communication Workers Union, which represents non-managerial grades, and Prospect, which represents the managerial grades. And you can see their responses at paragraphs 10 and 11. And finally, the, the trustee uh, issue in relation to representative beneficiaries is summarised at paragraph 13. So that's that point. Um, we have also uh, made some attempt, and I stress this is simply uh, a rough suggestion, it's not intended to be uh, a finished piece of drafting, of two potential ways that you could amend the PCSPS to uh, accommodate the full indexation of the GMP. So the, the two routes here, the first does it by reference to the Social Security Administration Act, and the second does it by reference to Section 109. So uh, at the front you have simply the um, scheme itself, and then there's an amendment to Rule 113A, which is the section we looked at yesterday, defining guaranteed minimum pension. So that is now as increased in accordance with 109 and where applicable to the new rule. And the first version of the new rule, Rule Y, effectively what it does is to read across the percentage increase uh, made by order of the Minister under the Social Security Administration Act to the guaranteed <coughs> minimum pension and to deduct from that such increases are, as are already catered for by Section 109. And the second version is a similar mechanism, but by reference to the order made under 109 itself. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes. May it please the court, I would like to start my submissions by recalling three um, points that are common ground in this case. The first is that the government was obliged to ensure price protection for public service GMP entitlement. And as Ms. Sorry, Rose has. Government, sorry, don't go too fast. Um, that the government was obliged to ensure price protection indexation for public service GMP entitlement. Um, as Ms. Rose emphasised yesterday, the government had made public commitments to do that. The second point is... That, is that generally across the civil service or this particular scheme? What, what all, is all official pensions. All official pensions. Yes. Is that documented in the evidence anywhere? Uh, yes, it's in Mr Kirk's evidence, and I can um, turn up the... If you just give us the reference. Yes. 
for you. Let, let, let your junior do that while you're making Thank you. Um, the second proposition is that the government was lawfully entitled to decide that the most appropriate means of doing that was by way of full indexation of the GMP. And the court will have seen that below, BT sought to challenge that decision, um, but that has now rightly been abandoned. And third, it is common ground that the increases legislation provides a bespoke statutory mechanism for achieving that. Indeed, we would go on to say that it provides the only mechanism ever deployed by the government for the purposes of indexing pensions in payment and preserved pensions. Ever deployed by the government for the purpose of purposes of indexing as regards official pensions, pensions in payment and preserved pensions. That, that third proposition is not common ground. No, I didn't suggest it was. It's no part of it. The, the first part, that it's a bespoke scheme, is not common ground either. My, my Lord, I, I, that's why I went on, that's why I said we would go on to say. So I wasn't suggesting that that was common ground. Right, so the, the, what is common ground is one. Let's just see what we've got here. Uh, so government obliged uh, to, um, uh, to ensure price protection, indexation, public service, and GMP entitlement. Uh, that's a common ground. That's right. And the reference, while my Lord's on that point, is Kirk 1, paragraph 20. This is the public commitments. Supplemental bundle 1, tab 6, page 98. So that is common ground. That's common ground. And second, what about the second one? Government second lawfully point. entitled to the side of the most appropriate way full indexation of GMP, challenged below, but not now that, but now. That's common that, ground. That's common ground. Right. And the third point that's common ground is that the increases legislation provides a bespoke statutory mechanism for achieving that. It's not common ground. It is. It's not common ground. It's not common ground. It's not the word bespoke. <laughs> okay, a statutory mechanism. I'll remove the word bespoke. It provides a statutory mechanism for achieving that. Yes. And you say it's the only mechanism ever deployed by government for indexing pay pensions in payment and... Uh, and preserve pensions. Preserve pensions. Now... What is, sorry, what, no, I, I ought to know about this, having done some of this stuff years ago. What is a preserve a pension? A preserve pension is when one leaves... For example, one's worked um, in the civil service for a number of years and then one leaves and goes to do something else, but you've, you've, you've got your accrued pension, which is well, preserved. A deferred pension. That's what I think. I, I think it's the same about thing. About 35 years ago. <laughs> Absolutely. My Lord, it's the same it's thing. It's the same thing. Now, the respondent's position is that it follows from these propositions that indexation via the increases legislation was the ordinary and neutral route for the government to adopt. The proposals put forward by BT were novel, and that we say is clear from the names that is clear from the names that they use to describe them. Um, the PS the PCSPS workaround and the statutory override. So what we say is that BT, what BT hoped to persuade the government to do here was something which was unconventional in order to protect BT's private interests. Now, Ms. Rose says that the impact of the decision on BT was inadvertent. So that was the word that she used repeatedly yesterday. Yes. Now, obviously, it wasn't inadvertent in the sense that it caught the government by surprise or that the government was unaware of, of this impact because the impact had been the subject of consideration during the course of the consultation. But we do accept that it was no part of the government's objective to impose a financial cost on BT. But it, it certainly, in our submission, does not follow from that, that adopting BT's proposals would have resulted in a neutral outcome. Absolutely. It doesn't follow from that. So it doesn't follow from the proposition that the government did not, it wasn't part of the government's objective to impose a financial burden on BT, it doesn't follow from that, that BT's proposals 
would have been neutral. We say, in fact, quite the opposite. Well, when you say neutral, what does that mean? Neutral. Well, so yesterday, um, Miss Rose, I think at the end of her submissions, drew an analogy with compulsory purchase. So she said, where there are two statutory, possible statutory regimes, yeah. and one of them, selecting one of them, would result in a burden or a, a cost to private parties, then what the government should be doing is selecting the one that doesn't do that. And we say that the analogy with compulsory purchase, you know, the court will recall her analogy between, she said, imagine you've got a statute that, that you need to compulsory purchase one property to build a railway line. And her, she said that you have a statute that allows compulsory purchase of the whole street and a statute that allows properties individually to be compulsorily purchased. And she said that obviously what the government should do in those circumstances is choose the one that is least own, causes less of a cost, and that's the one which can tackle individual properties. But we say that that analogy is, and that's what I mean by neutral, the, the least onerous, but we say that that analogy is not apt here and the reason it's not apt here, and this well, is really... So the least onerous to the person objecting. The, the, yes. And the, the reason we say that that analogy is not apt here is because, of course, avoiding a cost to BT would come at a cost to others, namely the BT pensioners. <coughs> <coughs> and that really is a fundamental point in this case in terms of the approach of the government to this decision. And we know... And we know this from uh, the witness statement of Mr Spencer, the chairman of the BT Pension Scheme trustee. And for your note, um, that's paragraph 53A, which is at Supplementary Bundle 1, tab 7, page 145. We know that the unions estimate that the average... Perhaps we could just turn that up. So that's at Supplementary Bundle 1, tab 7. Page 145, and it's paragraph 53A, and so you see there the unions estimated, based on the information provided by the trustee to members, that the average directly affected member <coughs> could lose £12,500 over the course of their retirement. They explain their belief that members would be effective, affected relatively consistent, consistently regardless of their earnings. And so the outcome of the case would be likely to affect women and lower income members disproportionately. Now, this raises another question that has, I'm not sure has any bearing on the outcome. I don't think it does actually on this case at all, but I was interested to know this. I mean, is there anything in the BT uh, uh, scheme itself which guarantees um, increases in pension to take account of increasing the cost of living? But that comment, 53A, presupposes that, there's, that they don't get anything, I assume, by way of, of, of increasing... No, no, this paragraph... So what you have in the scheme, of course, is the implementation of Section 109. Yes. But what this... And so this assumes that that, that... I mean, that will carry on, so BT will still be subject to the 109 obligation. And this is dealing directly with the impact of the government adopting... If the government had adopted BT's proposals to try and avoid the read across, yes. then this is dealing directly with the um, cost to members. Yes, I'm sorry, maybe I, maybe I'm, I'm a At the moment, these increases are done on the basis of the read across. Yes. That, that, that's what this whole issue is about. Yes. That's why we're here. Uh, because BT say, well, that's unfair to them. And the, uh, as I... Um, and I think she accepted, and actually I think this is right, I think she accepted yesterday for the, for the pre-1988 group, which is what we, the pre as I understand it, it's the pre-1988 B group members <coughs> who we're concerned with, yes. not concerned with the others. And I think she... Well, th we, we may be concerned, can I, there's a slight tweak to that. So right. we're concerned, we're definitely concerned only with the B group. Yes. Um, we're concerned in the main with pre 1988 
that we may be, we're not yet concerned with 88 to 97, but we may be if inflation rises above 3%. Well, I don't know, if it goes over 3%, yes. then I, I, I appreciate that. I didn't ask Ms. Ray that. But yes. that was a, if you go over 3%, then I assume what happens is the effect of the read across at the moment is they get topped up. Exactly. Yes, all right. Um, you're, you're right to raise that point. Um, let me just make a note of that. I think we worked that out, actually, for what it's worth. Uh, but um, the, the supposition is, and actually I think in view of uh, an answer that Ms. Reyes gave me yesterday, the subject actually is correct, which is that there's nothing, there, there's nothing apart from the read across. Um, so if you remove the read across, um, as I understand it, for the, certainly there, there is no other provision apart from the 109 for the post-1988 group. There's nothing else that guarantees members an increase in their pensions to take across. That's, that's my understanding. So that, that's, that, that's why I was asked about 30, 30, 53A, presuppo yes. 53A presupposes that. that. That's correct. In relation, of course, to the GMP element, that's what we're talking about. Oh, yeah, no, cool. yes. well, I didn't talk about the GMP element. Yes. Yeah. So, so my law's right. I, I agree with that. Um, so, so that, so that 12,500 is, they lose 12,500 in the course of their retirement. Um, so these are people who are currently in receipt of pensions. Yes. Um, uh, and I suppose it depends on what their life expectancy is. Well, there are also people that may become in receipt of pensions. So. But I mean, so when you say the average, I mean, I'm just sorry, I don't mean nitpicking. Yes. But I'm just trying to understand exactly what it's saying. I mean, there are different people who have retiring at different times. Yes. And they have different life expectancies. And so, so the averaging is a kind exactly. of a very general kind of general population. Exactly, it's a rough and ready calculation. It's, a rough, it's rough and ready. Yes. Uh, but um, this is the loss on the GMP element. Yes. Of, now, is this then, only, is this figure for the pre-1988 group? Doesn't, it doesn't make any supposition about the post-1988 group. That I'm not sure about, and it may be that Mr Hilliard can, well, can, Hilliard can deal with that, that later. It's, it's just a figure given by the um, CWU in their letter to the trustee. They, they don't explain, uh, not explain how it's further. reached. It's actually the, the letter from the CWU is attached to the notes which my learned friend... Right, let's take it, you, perhaps you can deal with that further uh, in, in due course. Just so your reference, it's page 225 of the um, clip behind the note that uh, Miss Rose oh, handed up at the start. Oh, That's the relevant page. That's where the 12.5 comes from. Uh, page 225 of the clip behind the note. Oh, today's note? Yes, absolutely. Oh, There's a clip of correspondence, BT writing to members, trustee writing to members, and the CWU. Um, anyway, I think for your purpose, I don't want to get too bogged down with detail, I don't want to understand it. For your purpose, the point is, and this is not in, this obviously is not in contention now, is certainly for the pre-1988 group of Group B, and if there was inflation above 3%, it would affect the post-1988 group. Because there is nothing else in the uh, pension scheme at the moment, the BT scheme, which guarantees a minimum indexation of increase, other than the read across, these people would be financially disadvantaged. Yes, my lord, that's the, that's the, that's that, the I mean, point. That's the and the, the point really is that when... That it's a simple point, which is that when Miss Rose talks about the loss and, and puts a figure on the loss to BT, yes. then what, what that loss um, comprises is money that would otherwise go to the pensioners if the read across were effective. So it's not, it's not a, a loss in the abstract to BT. So this is, this is why this is an important point in this case, because the government was faced with proposals from BT, which... I'm slightly careful about that. It's not a direct correlation because I assume that there'll be, I don't know, but I assume BT is saying they have to fund, that the, 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 the current scheme is not sufficiently funded to make this, so they will have to put more money in. Well, I'm not making a point about a direct correlation, no. so I'm not saying that there's a precise, a precise read across, but I'm making the point which, um, which, which I imagine um, is not... Um, a controversial point, yeah, yeah. which is that in order for BT to avoid this loss, yeah. that would mean that money 
which the pensioners would otherwise get, and we have a rough and ready calculation of, of what that would be for each directly affected pensioner, would, would now no longer get. And the reason that this is important in this litigation is that this was a central and animating concern of the government underlying the decision. So the reality is that what BT was seeking to persuade the government to do was to do something deliberate and something unprecedented in order to lead to a position where, yes, it would save money, but the corollary would be that the BT pensioners <coughs> would lose money. Now, you've seen the note that Miss Rose just handed up, and you know that um, before the proceedings, the BT pension trustee wrote to directly affected members seeking any relevant information. <coughs> Sorry, during the proceedings. And some examples of the responses are in the bundle. And I would just ask the <coughs> court to turn those up so that you get a flavour of what's being said by some of the pensioners. And if we turn up the second supplementary bundle, so supplementary bundle two behind tab 34. Um, you will see, and this is a point which is of direct relevance to ground five, you will see that some of the responses point to the fact that the pensioners were had been entitled to move from section A to section B, and that in their view they had been given commitments that their rights would not be affected, their rights to increases would not be affected. And so looking at page the letter um, on page 387, we see that point being made at number two, just directly below the second hole punch. I just asked the court briefly to read those two paragraphs. And then at the bottom of page 3888, you see just towards the bottom of that page, this. So when I see BT potentially trying to reduce my pension income again and not honouring commitments given to me, I feel robbed and cheated by them. I paid for my pension benefits in good faith and have had to endure constant retrospective changes to my pension without any recourse. And frankly, being robbed again of my GMP increase by BT or government is simply not acceptable. And um, there are, are more letters in this vein. I'll just show you one more. So on page, th on page 390, you have again a reference to section A <coughs> and section B. So going halfway down the page, um, within BT's submission to the court, they point out that the gov government consultation stated public servants have a right to full indexation of their public service pensions. BT does not make any reference to those of us who were Scheme A members, but change schemes as an enabler to take BT early lever options. I believe that this, if this is not highlighted to the court, it will be assumed that none of the current Scheme B members was ever a public servant. And then BT also refers to members of the scheme receiving a windfall should the Treasury's decision not be overturned. I believe this is incorrect, as it was always historically the case that Scheme A and Scheme B members received full index linking of their pensions, albeit partly met by the schemes and partly through secondary state pension uplift. And I'd like the court to know that due to the way that the new state pension scheme is calculated in relation to contracting out, BT, uh, pension, trust, BT pension scheme members in my position will be receiving a substantially reduced state pension. Should our pension also be reduced over time via a lack of full indexation of the GMP, it will result in a double whammy reduction rather than as a, win, a windfall as BT states. And then just one final letter on page 400. You see that this correspondent said that he joined... I just want to understand. I hope you can help me. I just want to make sure I understand the last paragraph there. Yes. So when, when this person, um, Albert Blackensee, says... Um, 
Oh, so it's the last paragraph. I would like the court to know that due to the way that the new state pension scheme is calculated in relation to contracting <coughs> out, BTPS members who might be receiving a substantially reduced state pension. And this is because the, G the GMP element uh, is now dealt with in the occupational pension scheme, is that right, rather than rather than reflected in the, in the state pension? This refers to the general overhaul of pensions that the government carried out, so <coughs> that the, the abolition of the basic rate and the AP. And so, as, as the government has pointed out, that will leave some people better off, but some people will be worse off. These are, these are the single pension rather than the, rather that's abolishing right. the additional pension. Exactly. And so this person is saying, well, I'll be worse off because of that. And that's compounded by, if, this, if, the, if my GMP is not indexed, that, that deficit will be compounded. That's the point that's being made. Well, the first of those consequences is, well, it's just the result of the government's decision to bring in that's a new, new state pension. I mean, my Lord, that's right. But, but it does go... Yeah. That, that's right, but it does go to a point that one sees in the contemporaneous documents where BT says, well, that, that the outcome might not be very bad for some of our members because they might be better off as a result of the government's overhaul. So it goes to that point, um, that, that limited point. I mean, for all I know, there may be other BT pensioners who actually benefit from the switch. Um, we, we don't know. We don't know. We can't assume that there are No, that's, there are that's a fair point, my Lord. Yeah. Um, so, going on to page 400, again you see the point about, uh, about Scheme A and Scheme B, and of course Scheme A, um, BT accepts, contains a complete mirror. So, what are you looking at now? So, page 400. 400. So, this correspondence says, I joined the post office telecommunications on 9th of September 1970. I was a Section A member of the scheme up until my, my retirement in 2015. And then I opted to take Section B benefits on retirement, as these were recommended as being better than Section A. I was not, however, informed when transferring into Section B I would give up my future rights to increases on GMP. Now, I show you these letters now as examples, both because it frames the legal issues which follow, because it, they go to substantiate our case under Ground 2, which is that the government was animated by this central policy concern of not being seen to prefer the interests of BT over those of the pensioners. But it will also, these, these, um, this correspondence will also be relevant when I come to make my submissions under ground five, because we say that what you see here is evidence from these particular correspondence that they were given, they, they they acted on the basis of representations that their uh, that their benefits, their GMP would continue to be indexed. Now that well, is. I'm what, not sure I can find the representation yet. There was just a lack of any information. That well, on that particular letter, letter it is, my lord. But on the previous letter, which is at that I showed you on page. Um, 389, I think it's page 389, there was there a reference to representations. Well, Ross, I don't know what's being said by the government, because as your lordships know, and your ladyship knows, <coughs> the decision by the Divisional Court was not made on the basis that there'd been any representation. There's no respondent's notice from the Treasury, and I'm very surprised now that on, on her feet, it's not in a skeleton argument, to hear it now being suggested that there may be a legitimate expectation derived from some previously unformulated representation. That's a radical change in the government's position. My Lord, that is not, no, that's not fair, and I'll come back to it under ground five, if I may. Um, but the position is, yesterday, Miss Rose presented the, both the court's judgment below on legitimate expectation and our submission as resting only on the administrative practice in relation to Section 59A, and that is not the position. I'll come back to deal with it, if I may, in the, in, in the, in, in the course of my submission. Um, the only advantage of the intervention is you now know what she's going to say. Yes, but, but my Lord, I fear that if I get lots of these interventions, I'm not going to actually get through my submissions. Um, so, moving back to um, Mr Kirk, and uh, Mr Kirk's witness statement, if I could just take you to the first supplemental bundle, and Mr. Kirk's first witness statement at paragraph, so that's behind tab six. Uh, this is in. Uh, this uh, is his. Supplemental one or two? Sorry, supplemental one. Yes. 
I'm tab six, you say? Tab six. Yes. And it's page 132. why what he concludes at paragraph 127 that you see there is that the decision not to adopt any of BT's proposals was perhaps the natural and certainly the most neutral decision the Treasury could have taken. It was simply a decision to do what would ordinarily be done in the circumstances and had been done previously to achieve exactly the same purpose. As is explicit from the November submission, our advice to ministers that it would be, was, was that it would be difficult to justify preferring the interests of BT to those of BTPS members on policy grounds. And now the threshold point I make about that is that what he's saying and what's clear from the documents, as I'll come on to show you, is that when the government is talking about preferring the interests of BT over the interests of BT pension scheme members. It's not at this stage of its thinking, weighing up, conducting an A1P1 analysis and weighing up property rights, apart from anything else. It's meaningless to talk about BT having property rights in this context. What it's doing is considering the, 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 the broader policy issue of preferring BT's financial interests over those of the financial interests of its members, of the, of the Section B members. Now, the Divisional Court rightly accepted at paragraph 130 of its judgment that this was um, a freestanding basis <coughs> for the decision under challenge. And the court said, as you heard yesterday, that it was self-evident. And we say it was right to say that. The, because the idea that a democratically elected government would consider adopting BT's proposals without thinking about how it would be perceived by pensioners and by the wider public and indeed by parliament is, we say, fanciful. But in any event, there is evidence that this was precisely a central concern of the Treasury when reaching the decision. And that's an issue that I will come back to in more detail under ground two. I'll just pause at the end. Um, does it, although this hasn't featured so far, is it any part of your submission that the fact that this is an interim solution and not a final one is of any relevance? Well, um, I, I don't think that that can matter because BT is saying that, that the decision as it stands is unlawful and so if BT is right then, then the decision must be quashed. Now another point that we would ask the court to bear in mind at the outset is this. Um, Miss Rose in answer to a question put to her by the court yesterday said that it's never been part of the government's case that the PCSPS workaround route in isolation would not have been effective. Now, that's of course, it's of course correct that all the parties in this case, because that turns on the construction issue, and it's of course correct that all the parties in this case have agreed that this point of construction should not be determined in, in, in these proceedings. But that agreement was made without prejudice to our right to refer in support of our case to the doubt surrounding the matter. So we're not asking the court to make a finding one way or the other on construction. That would obviously be inappropriate. But we do say that there was doubt surrounding the matter. And that's an important part of the factual context. And it's a part of the factual context that BT glosses over. Now, can we just turn up again the Section B rule? So what has been so what has been the parties have agreed that what will not be determined is whether on a proper construction of the section B rule, rule ten point two, the workaround proposal would have been exact would have been would have been effective. 
Yes. And so turning up, one can see how the question of construction arises, because if you turn up the rule, this is in supplementary bundle 2, behind tab 35. <coughs> And Rule 10.2 is on page 415. And, and so, to, to answer my Lord's question about what is the question of construction that would arise, the question of construction which would arise is whether the whether um, construed properly, um, this clause is only to provide increases under the increases legislation, or whether it confers a, a more broad, a broader right. And, um, and again, I'm not arguing the point, but I do want to make these submissions so that the court is aware of the doubt surrounding the matter. Um, a rule that's relevant that you didn't see yesterday is on the preceding page, page 414. And that says, so what, rule 1.2, little 1, that in these rules, unless the context otherwise requires... References to a statute or statutory provision shall be construed as a reference to the same as it may have been, or may from time to time be amended, modified, or reenacted. And so, what you see there is a broad provision, and, and clearly, Rule 10.2 has to be read in light of that broad rule. Now, Miss Rose compared the Section A rule to the Section B rule. Can we just have a look again at the Section A rule, which is behind the next tab? So you'll recall that the rule that Miss Rose showed you is Rule 1 on page 417, which is headed Purpose of These Rules. So that explains the purpose. And she said she pointed out there that the purpose includes a mirroring. But what she didn't show you is Rule 13.2, which is on page 423, which deals specifically with pension increases and which is cast in precisely the same terms. So that's on page 423. It's cast in precisely the same terms as the equivalent rule for Section B, Rule 10.2. And so the court can well see that, in fact, the Section A provisions might well support the broader construction of Rule 10.2, because it's not um, contested in relation to Section A that they are intended to mirror the PCSPS benefits. And yet it too, when it deals with increases, refers to the increases legislation. So, so uh, clause one of section B is a general provision about purpose. Yes. So you're saying, is this what you're saying? The specific rules about increases under section A is in 13. Yes. And so um, I, I wanted the court to see that because you didn't see it yesterday because Rule 1 is obviously the general purpose, but Rule 13.2 is the rule specifically dealing with increases and it, it's cast in exactly the same way as Rule 10.2 in Section B. Now, the reason that I'm taking the court and I'm making this point, the reason I'm taking the court... Um, so is, is, is the point here, I'm sorry, I hadn't fo focused on that before. No. So is the point here, because it's common ground that a workaround would not affect the, um, the uh, Section A members entitled. Yes. Right? And that what is said to make the difference, and now you've shown us 13, <coughs> is, 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 is the general description of purpose in one. That's what that's, sets make the difference. That's what makes the difference, although the actual substantive provision for effecting the change is exactly the same. That's what said to make the difference. Well, that's not right. It, I, I showed you, Lord Chief, so they ruled six. That's the crucial provision. It, it's quite <coughs> right that, 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 that Miss Rose showed you rule six, um, but we say what she didn't show you, and this is the point I'm making, is, is the specific rule that deals with increases, which is rule 13.2. And so the, the point I make, without, of course, seeking to persuade 
the court of, of the construction point because we're not here to decide it. I'm seeking to show the court that there is real doubt about the construction point. And that the point I make on Rule 13.2, just to go back to my Lord's question, is that it's common ground, as my Lord identified, that what this does is, is confers a mirroring. So 13.2 does. And it, yet it's expressed in exactly the same way. That's, that's, that's the only point I make. And, but we say that um, it's important to realise that. Um, because the real doubt that surrounds this question of construction goes to two issues in the case. It's relevant to ground one, because as I will come on to show the court, um, BT moved away from its initial position back in early 2016 from proposing the workaround as a freestanding solution. And what it did in its consultation response was quite clearly ask the government to only adopt a solution that included the statutory override. And as BT itself explained in its consultation response, that was in part due to the legal uncertainty as to whether the workaround would in fact work. And so the court can see that this question of doubt acknowledged by BT is relevant in this case because one of Miss Rose's submissions was, well, why would we ever not have proposed the workaround as a standalone solution? And part of the answer to that is because there was very real doubt as to whether it would actually achieve the purpose that BT intended it to achieve. Now, we say that this point is also relevant to ground five. And just to foreshadow my submission there, and I will deal with the point that the, the objection in due course that Miss Rose made, just to foreshadow my submission there, we say that the framing of Rule 10.2, the way it's framed, itself gave rise, and the divisional court so held, to a legitimate expectation on the part of Section B members that their pensions would be indexed in the same way as the PCSPS. So I will turn now to address in turn each of the five grounds of appeal advanced by BT. Um, as you are aware, BT's first two grounds of appeal are appeals to the factual conclusions reached by the divisional court and I'm going to address those two grounds together by reference to the document because I do want to go back to show you other parts of the document. Um, before doing that I will briefly address you on the proper approach in law to uh, appeals on uh, appeals to factual conclusions. Um, so our submission is that this is an appeal and not a rehearing and this means that it's not for this court to consider the matter afresh and that the proper approach is to consider whether the, the divisional court had legitimate and proper grounds <coughs> for reaching the conclusions it did. And we say that it's only if this court considers that the divisional court did not have legitimate and proper grounds for its factual conclusions that it's permissible to intervene. Now, um, not because we particularly seek to rely on it, but because Lord Justice Henderson raised the case yesterday of Henderson and Foxworth investment. Shall I just hand that up so the court can see what was said in that judgment? Do, do you want to see it? Yes, yes. Um, So I preface um, this by saying that this was an appeal from a trial, a decision of a trial judge in which there had been live evidence. But you see the, um, uh, an indication of the test applied at paragraph 62 and then 60, 
seven. Perhaps we should focus on six to seven. Um, so what, what's said there is that um, in the absence of some other identifiable error, such as a material error of law the, or the making of a critical finding of fact which has no basis in the evidence or a demonstrable misunderstanding of relevant evidence or a de demonstrable failure to consider relevant evidence, an appellate court will interfere with the findings of fact made by, by a trial judge only if it's satisfied that his decision cannot reasonably be explained or justified. And what we say about this is that um, we say that this is the correct test, but we recognise that the application of the test is liable to vary depending on the context. And so we accept that um, it would be more difficult to satisfy where, uh, or an appellate court would be more reluctant to intervene in respect of a trial judge's factual conclusions made on the basis of having heard cross-examination of witnesses, for example. But we say that the Smetch case demonstrates that the test still does apply mm -hmm. in a judicial review context. And Smetch is at the second authorities bundle behind tab 49. And so to give the court some context, this is an appeal from a planning <coughs> judicial review. And the appeal concerns the finding of the judge that even though, so even though the judge had found that the council had made an error in following the incorrect advice of the planning officer, the judge found that the, the um, local authority would have reached the same conclusion in any event and refused relief on that basis. And um, I, I think we can skip straight to um, paragraph 27. And so the court there found by reference... So, so d d does the court have paragraph 27? It's on page 1506. Um, the court found by reference to CPR 52.11 that the Court of Appeal must find that the decision of the lower court was wrong, and then says this is significant. It means that the task for this court in looking to see whether the judge was wrong so that the appeal should be allowed is to ask whether the judge had legitimate and proper grounds for reaching the decision she did, rather than simply for this court to approach the matter completely afresh and make up its own mind without regard to what the judge decided. And we say that's the test, that's the correct test. And then you have submissions at paragraph 28, and the submission in that case was similar to the, the submission made by Miss Rose in this case, which is that the judge below hadn't heard oral evidence, and so the Court of Appeal was as well appointed to, to reach a decision um, on, on this fact as the, as, the, as the judge below had been. And then at paragraph 29, the court says, I do not consider that this is correct. Um, even if the Court of Appeal might disagree, this paragraph is saying, um, with the judge's assessment below, it does not follow that the judge lacked legitimate and proper grounds for reaching their findings. As a result, it cannot be said that the judge below was wrong. And so um, we say that that's the right Approach. We see again at paragraph 39 on page 1511, um, at the end of that paragraph, I would not have considered that her decision based on that assessment could be said to be wrong, even if I might have made a different overall assessment of the position had I been deciding the matter afresh. So the distinction is drawn there. Now, it may be that there's not very much... So, so, uh, Trying to translate this into, <coughs> into language that can actually follow yes. the reality. At the moment, what this seems to me to be saying is, if there are two possible different in, in, in inferences that can be drawn from the facts, from the evidence, if there, if, there's, if, there, if there are two legitimate conclusions of fact that can be drawn depending upon the 
approach to it. The fact that you yourself would not have taken one doesn't mean to say the other one was, was wrong in this context. Yes. But, uh, but obviously that presupposes there's a, within, within certain limits they're both legitimate. Mm. Yes. They're both legitimate conclusions. Yes. Uh, and, and the difficulty with findings of fact is that, you know, it's difficult thinking, well, I suppose you can have two equally or more or less um, legitimate conclusions of fact. It's that sort of difficulty where they're, they're legitimate conclusions and saying that experienced and able judges can reach is more easily applied, I think, to, to law than to fact. Well, my lord, can I put it this way? If, um, when reading the documents, the court were to take the view, were to put a different interpretation on a document that placed on it by the divisional court, then we would say that that is not a reason for this court to intervene if it still considered that the divisional court's interpretation was open to it, was a legitimate, there was a legitimate basis for it. So the fact that, that the distinction is between considering it all afresh and reaching your own view and saying, well, we disagree with this, and, and, and looking to see whether, in fact, there was a proper and legitimate basis for the, the conclusions reached by the divisional court. So, um, and, and so... Well, I think that... Perhaps you can put it in a slightly different way. If the, if the proper term is legitimate, would you go so far as to say, uh, for the court to say it's not legitimate, it, it's really that no, no judge properly exercising their... I don't, think that, that. I don't think that the, the, the authority imposes a Wensbury-type test. I think it's a slightly um, broader test than that. So I don't, I'm not sure that it's right to say that you would have to be satisfied that this is, is a conclusion no reasonable court could, could have ever reached. But what I do say is that if looking at the documents, you say, to put it colloquially, if you say, well, I can see why the divisional court thought that, but I would take a different view. If, if one's in that um, sphere, then, then, then one doesn't intervene because it's not, it's not a rehearing, it's an appeal. And so you have to be satisfied the divisional court has gone wrong in some way. It, it may be that there's not very much between us because Miss Rose consistently through her submission, said the divisional court's conclusion is insupportable. And if, if what she means by that, and I apprehend it is, is that there's no proper basis for it, then it may be there's not very much between us on the test. But is it implicit in what you're saying that in order to come to a legitimate conclusion, the court has to take account of all relevant documents? Yes, yeah, so if there's a relevant document which the court... Uh, well, one has to be careful, my lady, because... Um, the court isn't required to enumerate all the documents it's looked no, at in its judgments. Yes. Um, but if there's a basis for thinking that some document was not put to the court um, and, and that that's critical, then, then that may well be a reason to intervene. But we don't say that, it's, we don't say that it would be, it's an acceptable approach to look at the judgment and say, well, they haven't referred to X document, because there are lots of documents in this case and they were all gone through over two days before a very strong divisional court, and so the idea that they would have missed some out, I think there would have to be evidence that, 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 that it wasn't, wasn't put to them or that they didn't see it. And this may not matter very much, but the sort of quasi Winsbury test you were disclaiming is in fact precisely what Lord Reed said in the Boxer case of paragraph 62. So, my Lord, he does say that, but he goes on, doesn't he, to... So, I, I think what I was responding to was the suggestion that Wensbury, that, that, so he goes on to say there are other bases for potentially intervening. It's the opposite of legitimate, it's illegitimate. Yes. yes. Which is quite, if you put it that way, it's quite a strong point yes. to say that the judge reached an illegitimate, an improper and illegitimate conclusion. Yes, well, that's what we say, that's what we say is the test. But, because yeah, but you sound like you're, you, you're, you, it sounded to me, that's what I was trying to put to yes. you, you're kind of retreating from that. No, no, I think the point I was dealing with is, I, I understood, I may have misunderstood my Lord's question to me about Wensbury as being, do, does, does, do I have to, so um, is it the case that Miss Rose has to show that there's a Wensbury error? And the point I make on, on paragraph, coming back to Lord Justice Henderson's um, observation, is that yes, of course, um, if they do show that, they get home, but there are a number of other, of other bases on, in paragraph 62 which are referred to as well. But I do, I do say that it has to be illegitimate. It has to be an illegitimate finding. And that's the, that's the, that's the same as, as saying no legitimate basis. So illegitimate basis is the same as no legitimate basis. <laughs>
So um, against that background, I will um, address grounds one and two together by reference to the materials. Can I, before turning to the materials, um, just say in a nutshell what our response is to each of the grounds so that you have my submissions in advance? So in relation to ground one, we say first that one of the express purposes of the consultation was to consider precisely the issue that BT is concerned about <clears throat> and to allow interested parties such as BT to set out in detail what they propose the government should do. We say second that BT did produce a detailed consultation submission which unequivocally sought a statutory override together with one of two other alternatives, namely um, an act of parliament other than the increases legislation or the PCSPS workaround. Thirdly... So that was, uh, there's a workaround, what was the other one? Um, a, an act of parliament other than the increases legislation. So it was said um, in the consultation, we'll see this, but if the government were to provide these increases under some other, adopt some other act of parliament, then that would also um, work because then it's not being provided under the increases legislation but under another act. Okay. An act of parliament, that's the same as the statutory override. No, so um, the, my lord, it's a little bit different. So both require legislation, but the statutory override would have permitted BT to amend its own pension scheme rules. But that would have needed an Act of Parliament. It would have, they would have both needed an Act of Parliament. Access. Yes. <laughs> um, thirdly, we say that, that that was the basis, so BT's carefully calibrated response was the basis on which the government considered BT's proposals and reached the decision and I will show you that read as a whole, the November submission, which is the key submission. Was the basis on which the government um, considered BT's proposals. Yes. And I will show you, I will make that good on the basis of the November submission to ministers which is um, the key document because it deals specifically with the <coughs> method of introducing indexation and it makes clear that the government proceeded on the basis that BT was seeking legislation to allow it to change its scheme rules. So those, those are our key submissions on ground one. Our submissions on ground two, if I could make those up front as well, um, are first of all that it is clear from the contemporaneous documents that the government <coughs> proceeded on the basis that first of all it did not wish to exceed to BT's proposals for policy reasons and secondly it therefore did not need to resolve the tricky legal issues surrounding A1P1 that were likely to arise and by policy reasons I come back to the points I made at the outset that what the government was focusing on in policy terms was the broad question, the presentational and policy issues associated with a decision which effectively meant that it was preferring <coughs> BT's financial interests over those of its Section B pensioners. So starting with the materials and... Miss Rose took you first of all to 
material in early 2016 which related to the first of the interim decisions which was not challenged. So in a sense this is all water under the bridge because, uh, because it relates to the first decision which is not challenged. But what we do see, which, is, um, which, which has some significance we say, is an inconsistency in what BT were asking for. And so um, if the court could turn first of all to the second supplementary bundle, I think this is a letter that you, you didn't see yesterday, behind tab 15. <coughs> Second supplementary bundle. Yes, had 15, second supplementary bundle. Oh, sorry, Mike, Mike. Yes, And um, on page 225, you should find a letter um, dated February 2016. I think we see from the covering email on the page before. Yes, that's 11th of February. It says I've attached we're it. Referred we were referred to it. You were taken to it. I'm very sorry. I apologise in those in that case. Um, so, what what you can see are two um, options which are set out over the page on page two two six, and the two options that are suggested at this stage. So we see there we consider that the best way of removing the potential unintended consequences for private sector schemes would be for the state to continue meeting the GMP increases for public sector scheme members um, outside of the public sector scheme framework. And then it says at two, so they're not specifically identifying here um, the workaround. That's equally consistent with the state. I think it's more consistent with the state meeting those obligations under a different statute, which you'll see then come up in the consultation response. And then you have, alternatively, the government could introduce into legislation a statutory override. And then you, you've seen already the letter... Um, ..from Sir, Sir Mike Ray. which is behind tab 18. And there, that does, as Miss Rose said yesterday, does directly at this stage identify the workaround to the rules on page 247. And you'll see by the first hole punch a reference there to the way in which BT was really seeking to lobby the government about all of this, because you see there they draw a link between the investments they're making in broadband, critical broadband, which is obviously an entirely separate issue, and these issues. Now, turning on to behind tab 20, This is the submission to ministers of the 17th of March 2016, so the date is wrong, as I think Ms Rose pointed out yesterday. <coughs> and turning to paragraph 5 on page 258. What you see here is, um, it is a, a, an express recognition at this stage too of the policy concern. So from a policy perspective, the BT group are right that the intention of this policy was not to impose a cost on BTPS, but rather to deal with inequality in the public service scheme. So they acknowledge that point. However, having considered both of these options, we have reservations from a policy and legal perspective. And then you have, so part of this is redacted, but then you have over the page a recognition of the <coughs> policy an expression of part of the policy concern. So it's not clear that the government should deliberately craft the relevant legal instruments to deprive the affected members of the DBTPS and possibly other private sector bureau schemes of the rights they would otherwise have been entitled to. And then you see another point, which again crops up in the consultation. While we expect most other mirror schemes also mimic the PCSPS, it's possible a solution which works for BT 
might not work for other mirror schemes, including because they mirror a different public service um, pension scheme. And again, when it comes to the doubt about the workaround being effective, this is a point that BT acknowledges in its own consultation response. And of course, if that had been correct, so the government's there high highlighting a possibility that working, having a workaround that works for BT only obviously wouldn't be lawful if there were other schemes in a, in a similar position. It would have to do the same for everyone in a similar position. Um, and then behind tab 21, again, you saw this yesterday, but just to recap, what you see here is that at this stage, having proposed in Sir Mike Brake's letter the workaround, BT is faced with the government's conclusion that the workaround would be ultra-vires. Now, that's, a sub, that's the subject of ground three. But this was, we say, um, a factor which no doubt helps explain why BT, in its consultation response had rowed back from suggesting the workaround as a standalone option. Now, the next key document is in the first supplemental bundle. It's the consultation itself. And I just want to show you um, some other parts of it. It's behind tab one of the first supplemental bundle. And... Um, starting at page yes. so starting my Lord at page 22 and paragraph 4.2 you see here again a clear delineation between the policy question that the government's facing and then the subsequent legal question. What is this document? This is the, the government's consultation document to which BT responded. And so Miss Rose showed you yesterday, um, she, she showed you earlier parts of this document. I think she also showed you um, rule 4.2 as well. But the earlier parts of the document that she showed you yesterday deal with the, me with, with the, the, key, the main issue as to whether to have indexation or um, one of the other two options, or indeed any other alternative option that anyone else could identify. And at this stage, they're dealing with impact on the wider public sector and private sector, which is the issue in this case. And um, what, what that says is that, um, I'm looking halfway through the paragraph, we wish to understand how their rules align to those of the public service <coughs> pension schemes, whether the government should take action to avoid a read across. So the weather point, that raises the policy question of whether it would be appropriate to do it, and if so, what specific actions they feel the government could take. So that raises the legal issue of what would be lawfully possible to do to avoid these implications. And we see that reflected in the questions that are asked. And so... Um, Question 12 is how could the delivery of any of the policies impact wider public sector or private sector schemes who are not official pensions? That's question 12 on page 22, just immediately below. And then question 13, um, if wider public sector or private schemes who are not official pensions are impacted by any policies set out in the consultation, why were the pensions designed to mirror official pensions originally. So you can see what the government's trying to get at there is, well, why, why, why did you have these mirror provisions? And that's, of course, relevant to whether or not it would be fair to, um, to, to, to stop them working. And then at 15, sorry, at, at 14, this is the policy question, should the government take action to avoid any read across between private sector schemes and any policy announced. And then at 15 is the legal question, are there actions the government could take to restrict the impact on wider public sector or private sector pension schemes who are not official pensions under the PIA? And then at 16, again, this raises squarely the policy question, why should government allow 
for members of schemes whose rules mimic or mirror those in the public services to be deprived of the benefit of those rules. So you can see here that in the consultation itself, yes, that the, the government's interested in the legal question of whether there's any lawful means by which this can be done, but it's also um, very animated by the policy question of why there is this mirroring and why should it take, why should it, would it be appropriate to take this action? Now, the next document is, the, is BT's consultation response, so it's response to that document, and it's behind the next tab. Now, we say that this document is obviously key when determining um, the first ground. So what is it that BT were asking for? And we say that it clearly describes the statutory override as a necessary constituent element of any of the proposed solutions. And uh, going back to paragraph 1.11 on page 27, we see uh, this was drafted by Freshfields, and we see how carefully it was drafted. So this is not loose language. This is lawyer's language, no doubt very, very carefully considered. And what we see there is a very carefully and detailed, calibrated description of what is being sought. And what we see is that um, we request that HMT make certain adjustments to its proposals. Then at A, introduce into legislation the statutory override, and, so and, either, and there are two options at B, little one and little two, implementing full indexation or the case-by-case -case option through an act of parliament other than the increases legislation, or the PCSPS workaround. And then there's an or. So in the alternative to all of to, to that solution, converting GMPs into normal scheme pension and revoking the ministerial direction. So that's the conversion option, which of course we know the government did not ultimately, um, at that stage at least, um, accept, although it's now exploring it further. So that is then uh, going forward in the document to page 29 and paragraph 33.2b. We see, we see here the reference to the Act of Parliament other than the increases legislation. And they say if that was going to be done... Page 39. Page 29, my Lord. It's, um, it's at the bottom of page 29, and it's paragraph 3.2. And I'm looking at little b. So A explains how BT's liabilities would be increased. B talks about the Act of Parliament. So this is one of the two alternatives other than the workaround. And then... It says, over the page, in a similar vein, implementing continued full indexation through a PCSPS rule amendment rather than via legislation would also avoid the unintended impact. But then, and this is critical, that said, the legal analysis is likely to be complex and there could be differing views on how the Section B pension increase rule should be interpreted with the potential need for clarificatory court proceedings. So pausing there, this goes back to the doubt point, and that's why I showed you at the outset, I went back to the rule and showed you the, the, showed you the relevant part of the Section A rule as well, because there is this doubt, which B, B, BT is squarely acknowledging here, which, is, which they say might, uh, result, might need court proceedings. There is this doubt about whether it would work. And then they go on to say, this approach may also not work for other affected private sector schemes, depending on their scheme rules. And again, that's a point which we've seen um, also in the documents, because obviously that's a point the government's going to be concerned about, because if there are other <coughs> schemes in the same position or a similar position as BT, what the government plainly can't do is do something which will only help BT. And so, given this legal uncertainty, we would urge the government to also introduce into legislation a statutory override. <coughs> and that's why D 
then focuses on the statutory override. And it, what it refers to is an annex to this submission. So you see that at the bottom of subparagraph D, we enclose as an annex advice received from Freshfields, which we've shared previously with HMT and DWP, setting out the clear public interest basis for introducing such a statutory override. Now, I'm going to so that's at um, the bottom of subparagraph D. We're still on page 30. I'm going to come to the annex in a moment, but just working through the document and moving on at this stage to page 33, what you have here is an answer to the consultation questions <coughs> that I took you to a moment ago in the consultation document behind tab one. And so you've got question 14 set out there, should the government take action to avoid any read across, which is the policy question, and BT are confronting that policy question, and they're saying, yes, there are strong public interest reasons for the government to take action. And then you see, and this is a point that I adverted to earlier in response to a question put to me by Lord Justice Henderson, at 3.11, that's what I was thinking of when I said that there's a reference in BT's submission to the fact that um, the new state pension might result in gains. Oh, yes. Yes, so that's... But here what we see is a, is, is a direct grappling by BT with the policy question posed by the government of whether it would be appropriate for the government to take this type of action. Now, moving on to question 15 over the page... So do you want us to note anything in 3.11? You, you referred to 3.11 no, I, it was just really to point out, it's really to point out a, 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 something I'd mentioned earlier in response to a question. I just wanted to locate it. So, question 15, um, that raises the legal question. Um, it, so that's the legal question raised by the consultation. Are there actions the government could take? And then here's the answer. And the answer is, again, could make the following adjustments, introducing a statutory override and either implementing full indexation through an act of parliament other than the increases legislation or an amendment to the rules. And again, you have the reference, uh, again, setting out the same point in 3.14, given the potential uncertainty about um, the, the workaround, we urge you also to introduce a statutory override. So we say this really couldn't be clearer they're directly answering the question which is posed by the government in the consultation precisely for this purpose. Now, moving on to the annex. <coughs> the annex starts on page 37. And the annex is solely concerned with the statutory override. And we see from the summary on page 37 um, that, uh, that, that at 1.1, there's a direct reference there to the statutory override. Um, and they then say at 1.2, this is all in the summaries, they recognise as... Ms. Rose did yesterday, that the statutory override engage, would engage A1P1. And then at 1.3, they say that, so 1.2, they say that that means that it has to be justified and it goes through the steps that are required under A1P1. <coughs> and then at 1.3, we consider that these tests can be met. In particular, the state may credibly advance a public interest aim for the application of the statutory override on the ground that the proposed power would address. And then there are um, sub-paragraphs which are set out, which reflect, which are a summary of the remainder of this <coughs> submission. And just going through to show you the structure of the submission, so um, that's the introduction. And then you have at three on page 39 at 3.1 um, in order to decouple the BTPS from the practices of the PCSPS 
it would be necessary to amend the relevant increases rule. So in other words, you need the statutory override. And then you have a description of the statutory override in section two, starting on page 40. And then moving on, on page 42, you have the heading human rights and you have a discussion of article one of the first protocol. And then again, moving on, page 44, against that background, this is paragraph 5.11, we consider the state may credibly advance a public interest aim in order to justify it. And then moving on further, this is really just to show you the structure of this submission. On page 48, you have a heading just um, between the two hole punches, fair balance and proportionality. And you then have a discussion of how the proportionality <coughs> requirements would be satisfied. And so what we say about this is that standing back, it is a lengthy and detailed legal analysis drafted by Freshfields in order to support the central solution that BT was proposing in its consultation response. Now, it recognises the difficulty in the government adopting this solution, namely that, that on BT's, as BT itself acknowledges, this would engage Article 1 of the First Protocol but what it seeks to do is persuade the government that this, detail, this difficulty be, can be overcome. And it seeks to do that by a detailed examination of legitimate aim and justification. And we say that this document, this annex, is wholly inconsistent with the idea that BT was advancing the workaround as a standalone solution. Because it had obviously taken the view that the workaround by itself couldn't do the job, or at least risked not doing the job. It knew that the government had concluded that the workaround would be ultra vires because the government had said that, and we've seen that. And it recognised the legal uncertainty surrounding the construction issue. And it recognised that it would not cater, or may not cater, for other schemes in a similar position. And so that's why BT devoted all of these efforts to persuading the government that the statutory override should be adopted and, and why it would be lawful. And what we don't have here, what we don't have in this consultation exercise is any equivalent at all to the document that Ms Rose handed up this morning, which is a draft of how the workaround might operate. And, my lords, my lady, if BT had seriously been contending at this stage that the workaround was the option, was, was, the, was the solution, of course it would have explored that in more detail and produced some, something equivalent to this annex in relation to the workaround, or at least a draft of how that might be accomplished. But it wasn't doing that, and it said it wasn't doing that. That's the consultation response. Now, what Ms. Rose says about that is, well, that's not how the government understood the consultation response, because what was actually put to ministers was the workaround as a freestanding solution. Now, we say, well, that would be very surprising given the clear terms of the consultation response. And one bears in mind, of course, that the purpose of the consultation, the very purpose of seeking and eliciting this submission is precisely so that the government can see what it is that BT is seeking and, and consider the point. And when Miss Rose says, oh, well, so Mike Rake wrote a letter a, a year before saying a workaround solution, we say, well, that's, the, the government can't possibly be required, having conducted a consultation, having seen the very clear terms in which BT was seeking the statutory override, to say, oh, I remember there was a, there was a letter from Sir Mike Rake 15 months ago that said something a bit different. We say that's a completely implausible way of saying that the government should be proceeding in these circumstances. Now, turning to the submissions, um, Ms Rose relied first on the October submission, 
And we see that in the second supplemental bundle behind tab 24. <coughs> behind tab 24. And so the court will recall that Ms Rose explained yesterday um, how the submissions to ministers proceeded in two stages. So the first stage, which is the October submission, did not focus on the BT issue, if I can put it that way, um, but was asking for a decision in principle about indexation. And, sorry, it's tab 23, I've got the wrong tab. So what day, the consultation response was when? Sorry, it's 24. <laughs> it's 24. Consultation response was when? Consultation response was um, in, um, let me get the right... Date. So that was the 20th of February 2017. <coughs> now we're looking at the document of the October 2017. Yes, and so what's happened by this stage is that the consultation responses have all been digested and considered. And you then have the submissions to the ministers, and those proceeded in two stages. <coughs> and um, this stage is not directly concerned um, with the... BT issue, because that's been expressly deferred to a later stage, and it's then the subject of the November submission. But what Ms Rose places emphasis on here um, is paragraph 15, which is on page 279. And what would be helpful for me is that one, in relation to one document that Ms Rose placed great weight upon, she said it wasn't referred to by the Division of Court, was very important. 14th of February. Yes, I'll, 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 I'll do it. I, I, I can't remember what the document was. Yes. I, I would like to. I, I, will, I, will, I think I'm going to come to that. If I wasn't going to, I will come to it. Thank you. Um, yes, I am going to deal with that. Um, so, paragraph 15 on page 279. Um, so, Miss Rose places weight on the fact that this says, so if one sees, to prevent this cost to the scheme, BT has requested that we consider a statutory override of scheme rules, an act of parliament, or an amendment to civil service pension scheme rules, which BT mirror. Yes. Now, we say that she relies on the word or, and we say that simply can't bear the weight that she proposes to put on it. And the reason is that this is a broad sum. It's true that all of these options, these three options, were put to the government in the consultation. But this is just a summary here of the options that were put. So it's not purporting here to make the nuance point about the combinations of the, um, of the, of the options. And so um, one can see, so if one, if one replaced, for example, the word or with and, so if one saw that, if one replaced it and says BT has requested that we consider a statutory override of scheme rules, an act of parliament and an amendment, that would also be inaccurate because they weren't suggesting all three of those things together. They were suggesting the override and one of the other two. And so what this does <coughs> do is descend into that detail. But as I will show you, it's clear that what the ministers understood was that BT was seeking as an essential component the statutory override. Now, just while we're on this document, to show you over the page, paragraph 16, again here we see um, a, a reference to the policy concern that the government had. So our initial view is that at pri privatisation in 1984, it was the policy intent that the rights of BT employees to future pension benefit indexation be protected, regardless of any future changes in the pension system. So you see them there referring to the, the overriding policy question. Now, it's the November submission that's more important because um, that is the submission that's directly concerned with the mechanism for extending indexation and, and therefore the BT issue. And it's behind tab 26... And what we say is that this makes clear that all of BT's, that the government understood BT's proposals necessarily to include the statutory override. 
And then separately in relation to ground two, it also shows that the government had a freestanding policy concern about the appropriateness of taking any action which would prefer BT's interests over those of its pensioners. Now, the very key paragraphs in this submission are the recommendation at the beginning and paragraph 18 at the end, which is the question posed to the Chief Secretary. To, 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 yes. Because that crystallises... Those two things crystallise what it is that the Chief Secretary is being recommended and the question that's being put. So you said this, this is more important. What, because it because of why? Because of, then the October submission. It's more important. I don't think this is in contention. I think Miss Rose said the same. It's more important because it's it's dealing specifically with the method of extending indexation, which is the concern that BT has. Whereas the October submission is dealing with the in principle question of whether to continue indexation. So what, what we do say is that in um, reading this document, that the most important parts of it are where the advice to and, and the question to the minister is being is crystallised. And we see that in the recommendation at the beginning so the recommendation, this is at the top of page 284, that you confirm the intention to extend the current GMP policy solution for a further two years while we review a longer-term solution and agree not to legislate to change the rules of some affected private sector schemes by removing or enab enabling the removal of their obligations to index pensions in accordance with the legislation governing public sector schemes. And you see there, underlined, agree not to legislate. And we say that that plainly <coughs> refers to the statutory override, which would require legislation, and does not refer to the workarounds, which would not require legislation. It would require simply an amendment to the rules. And then we see, just moving... To, to the end of the document, I'm going to come back to the middle bits, but these are the bits we say are most important. On page 288, we see paragraph 18, which is in bold, and this is where the question to the minister is crystallised. So do you agree, first, that we should ex extend the government's indexation, interim indexation policy um, going forward until the 4th of April 2021? And then secondly, and this is the key bit, do you too also agree to rejecting BT's request for the government to legislate to remove or enable the removal of their obligations under the BTPS rules? And then this is important too. If not agreeing to, should we work further with DWP on the possibility and implications of a carve-out for BT and seek council's opinion? Now, going back, to the consultation response. What uh, we say is that this reflects entirely the consultation response because what you had in BT's consultation response was a request at a minimum for the statutory override, or rather to put it another way, all of its proposals required the statutory override. So this is being recognised here. Do we reject BT's request for legislation? And then it's saying, well, if you don't agree with that, We've got all of these points about A1P1 to consider, which were the subject, as you've seen, of the annex. So do we take this forward with um, council? So do we explore the legal issues that arise? And so what, what, we, what we take from this, what we say, is that this shows two things. So it shows that the government correctly understood, first of all, and this is ground one, that BT was asking for legislation, i.e. the statutory override, and it shows, and this is in relation to ground two, that the government was asking, first of all, do you agree to rejecting this request? And then separately, which we say is the policy issue, do you agree, do you agree that this should be rejected on policy grounds? And then secondly, if, if you don't agree to this, 
then we'll need to confront the legal issues. And so there's a two-stage analysis. Now, going back to the, the, the first page, on page 284, we see in the summary, again, a reference, <coughs> so you see the summary section in the middle of the page, and the last line, <coughs> have asked that we consider a legislative carve out for their scheme, we recommend against exempting BT or any other scheme. So again, it's referring, so that's on page 284, my Lord, and it's the summary in the middle, and I'm looking at the last two sentences of that summary section just by the second hole punch. So my Lord have that. So has asked that we consider a legislative carve out, and I'm placing emphasis on the words legislative carve out. And then, moving forward in this document to paragraph 9, impacts are under the heading impact on BT at page 285. That's the bottom of page 285. BT, so uh, it, it first of all explains the mirror requirements. And the, then all these underlines were in the original. Yes. <laughs> And then says, BT has asked us to legislate to exclude Section B members. And again, we place emphasis on the, words, on the word legislate. Now, the paragraph that BT rely on is <coughs> paragraph 12. And they again place emphasis on the word or. But we say that that can't fairly be taken in isolation as amounting to the government thinking, despite BT's clear consultation response, that the workaround was being advanced on a standalone basis. What it is, in reality, is a compressed summary of what BT was asking for. It was asking for all of those things in the consultation. And the reason that that's set out in compressed summary is because the submission then goes on to say that there are policy issues attaching to all of these things. So it's looking at those things in the round and saying, well, for any of them, there's a policy issue that arises. So what this document is not doing here, so having made quite clear in paragraph 9 in the recommendation and in the final question, what you can't read into the word or is that suddenly, despite all of that, and despite BT's clear consultation response, the government is somehow thinking that the workaround is being advanced as an independent solution. And what you can see in paragraph 12 is that there are two stages to, to paragraph 12. So TLA advised that in each case there would need to be a pol policy justification for preferring the interests of BT to the interests of the scheme members. That is the broad policy concern that I identified at the outset. And then they go on to consider the significant legal issues surrounding the statutory override. And you see there uh, an examination of the various points <laughs> that BT had squarely confronted in its consultation request. And then moving over the page to paragraph 14, you see again a um, clear recognition of the, of the general practical and presentational issues, so the policy issues that would arise in relation to carving BT out of the obligations. And the second bullet point is important. So that says, since 2015, the Treasury New Fair Deal policy ensures that members of public service schemes transferred compulsorily to the private sector retain their pension rights, and a similar policy was in place previously, a decision to carve BT out would seem to contradict this policy. If we decided to do so, the government could be seen as acting to remove BTPS obligations to index pension benefits in the same way as under the 1974 civil service scheme, BT have requested this. Government could also be seen to be acting against members' financial interest it would be asking why it was preferring the interests of BT to those of its pensioners. 
So what it's saying, it's not saying here that the new fair deal policy applies. It's saying, look, we've got this policy in place, which is that members of public service schemes which are transferred to the private sector should keep their benefits. And if we take this deliberate step, that would seem to weigh against that policy. And then you see separately at 15, legal risk is high, a judicial review brought by members or trade unions is likely, and unless we were able to develop a defensible justification for interfering in property rights, there's a high risk of the judicial review being successful. So that's the separate legal point about um, the A1, P1 analysis. But as you see from, as we've seen from paragraph 18 over the page, that's the point that would be taken forward only if the recommendation to refuse all of this on policy grounds is rejected. And, and, and going back to 14, what you see there is a reference to at the end of the second bullet. Government could also be seen to be acting against members' financial interests. So when, when the government, when these Where submissions... Is that? Where is that? So I'm looking at, at paragraph 14, the second bullet. I have, said th I have read this, but I just wanted to emphasise the words financial interests. Because what, what the government's not doing at this stage of the analysis is weighing property rights. It's taking, it's taking a broader overview of the presentational and policy issues that would arise if it were to be seen to be preferring the financial interests of BT over the financial interests of its pensioners. Now, that's what I wanted to say about that submission. Um, we see behind tab 26A, the question put <coughs> to the Chief Secretary and the response. And so starting with the question put at page 288.2, .2, if the court has that. This is an email which, is t which attaches, this is behind my lord, the next tab, so it's 26A. Do you have that? <coughs> so this is, first of all, you have the response from the Chief Secretary. and then, but, but can we first of all go to the email that was sent to the Chief Secretary, which is on the next page, 288.2. .2. And what you see is that that attaches, you see at the top, the final submission that I've just taken you to. And then... What's said, and I'm looking at the bullet points between the hole punches, last time, this is the penultimate bullet point, last time we advised in October, the Chief Secretary was content for us to proceed on this basis, that's extending the interim solution, subject to this further advice on private sector impacts. BT in particular have asked for us to legislate for a carve out of their obligation to follow public sector service pension index rules in their scheme rules. We recommend against doing so. The bar for removing indexation rights from BT members would be very high. Now, on the, net, on the previous page, and so again, I, I place emphasis on the words BT have asked us to what legislate. Does that, what does that mean? The bar would be very high? What does that mean? I think that that is then going on to consider the A1P1 point, because, and that makes complete sense, because what's being addressed here is the statutory override that's why we have the words legislate. BT have asked us to legislate. And as we know from their annex to the consultation response, BT acknowledge that the override engages A1P1 such that justification will be required. Now, the previous page, 288.1, is the answer. So the Chief Secretary agrees, and there's two bullet points, to extend the current GMP policy solution for a further few, two years while we review a longer-term solution, and two, not to legislate to change the rules of some affected private sector schemes. So you can see here directly that what's being considered is the statutory override, and indeed that explains why it's being said on the, 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 the next page that the legal bar is high because BT itself has acknowledged that the statutory override engages A1P1. Now, um, moving 
on to the government's published consultation response. This is in the core bundle behind tab 12. Starting at page 303, we have the heading Private Sector Organisations. And we have... January 2018. Uh, yes, that's right. So this is the, the response, this is the decision, it's the response to the consultation. Right, what are you looking at? So I'm looking at page 303, and um, the court will see there's a heading towards the bottom of the page, Private Sector Organisations. This is the page. You're taking to this, yes. And um, you see so you see there that two private sector schemes responded to this, and one consultee noted that they would, so that's the other consultee, noted they would honour the requirements of their trust deed. So, so I, I just mentioned that because Ms Rose said repeatedly yesterday this is a BT-specific problem. It's not quite right because there was another consultee who's affected in the same way, but they've... It's not that they're not affected, they've simply chosen to honour their commitments. And then we see what's being asked at 3.19. The other consultee, that's BT, requested that the government should craft its response in such a way so as to avoid the read across. And then we have the government's response. <coughs> However, the government believes it would not be appropriate to act in a way that would deprive members of indexation to which they would otherwise be entitled. Now, pausing there, <coughs> we say that that's the policy <coughs> question. That's why the government talks about it not being appropriate to do that. And then we see acting to do so would also raise legal <coughs> questions, including whether there was a legitimate aim and interference in property rights and justification. And so again, what we see is a juxtaposition of two things. So first of all, the policy question, which was the subject of three of the questions in the consultation, would it be appropriate to do this? They say no. And then secondly, in addition, it would also raise legal questions. Well, of course it would, because what's being sought is the statutory override, which BT itself recognises would raise legal questions. Now, going back to... We say that BT understood this, and we see that from their response, which is going back to the second supplemental bundle. And I apologise for uh, taking the court backwards and forwards in different bundles, but I'm trying to do it chronologically. Um, so this is the second supplemental bundle behind tab 27. I don't think you saw this yesterday. It's BT's response to the decision. And um, what this recognises are there are three constituent parts to the government's conclusions. And we see that between the two bullets. Do you see just above, just between the two hole punches, just above the bullet? Please, could you provide the reasons for the government's conclusions, in particular, breaking down paragraph 3.19 into its three constituent parts, and then we have... This is from and to. This is from BT to the Treasury. So it's responding to the decision. Uh, and so what we say here is that BT here recognised that the government was proceeding in the stages that I just described. And we see that because BT itself has broken down paragraph 3.19 that I just took you to in the same way that I just did in my submission. So it says, first of all, the first constituent part is the government believes it would not be appropriate to act in a way that would deprive members of indexation. And then it, it recognises, indeed, that the government asked at question 16 whether it should do this, that's the policy question, Please, can you explain why you don't think it's appropriate? And then they separate out themselves the legal questions. 
and they refer to their annex. So they say, well, we've given you our annex, our annex, which is all about why the statutory override is justified. Can you please tell us why you don't agree with our annex? Note that there's nothing here saying, well, you don't need to bother about justification because we've advanced the workaround as an independent solution and that doesn't engage A1P1. I'm so sorry? I'm asked to show you the third bullet. In addition, some of the mechanisms suggested by the consultee to avoid this impact are outside the scope of the government's statutory powers. Yes, Ms. Rose is right. So that <coughs> does refer to the workaround. But what we say about that is it doesn't say anything, and indeed the government's decision doesn't say anything about whether that's been looked at in a freestanding way. It was part of the proposal being put by BT, and, this, uh, and the government responded in the decision by saying it didn't think that um, it was within the scope of its statutory powers. Now, I think, finally, my Lord, I'm going to get now to the letter of the 14th of February, which is um, a post-decision letter, and that's in the first supplementary bundle. tab three, so that's supplementary bundle one behind tab three. And this is a letter sent post-decision whereby the Treasury wrote to BT to explain the reasoning in its decision. So it's responding, <coughs> I apprehend, to the, to the letter we've just seen. And so... Um, what you see here is that we say, just looking on the first page, so um, the third paragraph, starting in considering its response to this consultation, the government has, has sought to balance the interests of scheme members, public service schemes and departments, those private sector schemes affected by this policy as well as the taxpayer. You've noted in the government response that we did not consider it appropriate to attempt to craft a policy which removed from private sector scheme members, including members of BT Pension Scheme, the indexation to which they would otherwise be entitled. And so that, we say, is plainly relating to the policy question, is it appropriate to act in this way? And we see um, at the bottom of the page, in the next paragraph, a reference to the statutory override, and again we, we place weight on that, so we believe that removing the existing obligation of the BT pension scheme to index in line with the PCSPS would be to act against the interests of members. As you have recognised, these members have a property right to indexation. The bar for removing these rights is high. And Ms Rose accepted yesterday that refers to the statutory override. And the reason that that's being referred to is because that was a necessary constituent part of the proposed solution. <coughs> now... The, the, the part of this letter that Ms Rose places weight on is the next paragraph on page 56. And she relies on the fact that it says, you put forward several proposals as, how to, as, how government, as to how government could deliver its policy objectives to equ equalise and index the public service GMP but avoid the impact on the BT pension scheme. And then it says one would involve primary legislation, um, Another would be to make changes to the scheme rules, and a third, yeah, to the scheme rules. So that's what it's. So those are the those are the two, in addition to the state statutory override, the two. The first one is the statutory override. Um, so what 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 Miss Rose says is she places weight on the words you put forward several proposals. But what we say in response is that that doesn't help her because it's correct that BT put forward several proposals. They did put forward the statutory override and the workaround and the alternative act of parliament. But what this doesn't establish is that, the, that BT put forward the workaround as a standalone solution and that the government understood it to do that. It's simply referring to the several proposals put forward by BT. 
and it's perfectly consistent with BT's consultation response, which makes clear that the statutory override is a necessary component of what it's asking for. And what the government then concludes is that can all... Can we just read this for a yes. <laughs> yes, I mean, I think she goes a bit further than that. It's not just several places it says one would involve and another would. Mm. Yes. I think she relies on those words. My Lord, that's fair. But what we say in relation to that is that's perfectly true and perfectly consistent with what BT actually did and what the government understood. Because they did put forward these different proposals, and one would do that, and one would do the other. But what this doesn't address, it simply doesn't touch on the question, is, is the question which is issue in ground one, which is, did they seek the, over, the, the workaround as a standalone solution? And we say it's clear it, it, they didn't. And that's simply not touched on by this, because this is true as far as it goes. It did put forward sev several solutions, and, and the, this is an accurate description of those solutions. And, and what's then said is that all such proposals would involve the government acting against members' interests. And as the consultation response says, the government believes it would not be appropriate to act in a way that would deprive members of indexation to which they would otherwise be entitled. So that's the policy question. That's the financial, that this would harm the members' financial interests. It wouldn't be appropriate to do it, which is raised by consultation question 16 squarely. And then it says, there would, in addition, be legal issues as to whether the high legal bar to removing property rights was met. Our view is that there would be a significant risk of a legal challenge being brought were the government to craft a policy which interfered with members' rights. Now, we say that this is, first of all, wholly consistent with paragraph 18 of the November submission, which adopts a, a, asks the sector asks the chief secretary to approach the question in two stages one as a matter of policy would it be appropriate to act and secondly if you don't accept that we recognize there are these difficult legal issues surrounding a1p1 and we say it's also perfectly consistent and that's why you have the focus on the override at the bottom of page 55 with the clear way in which BT put forward its, its proposal in the consultation response and the way in which it was understood by the government when it repeatedly said in the November submission and, and, and throughout these contemporaneous documents, what BT is asking us to do is to legislate. Now, Ms Rose made a point uh, about Mr Kirk's second witness statement and I want to deal with that briefly. Um, so we find that um, in the same bundle behind tab 10, She relied on paragraph seven, and so sorry. <coughs> so sorry. So that's supplementary. It's the same, bundle, it's the same bundle, and it's behind tab ten, page one seven eight. So Miss Rose um, relied on paragraph seven, and she said that. This makes it absolutely clear that the government understood that the workaround was being put forward as a standalone solution. But with respect, we, we say it doesn't do that at all. What it's responding to is a contention that the workaround was not put to ministers. And he says this is wrong. And of course it's wrong because the workaround was put to ministers because it, it was put forward by BT in its consultation, just not in a self-freestanding way. So he's responding to that point. He, what, what it doesn't say is that BT put forward the <coughs> workaround as a freestanding solution. Now, just while we're on this, um, we place reliance on paragraphs 5 and 6 
because this very clearly explains the points I've been seeking to make by reference to the contemporaneous documents, which are that the decision not to adopt um, any of BT's proposed solutions was a policy choice. And you see there, we address a logically prior question first. This is paragraph five. Did ministers want to prefer the interests of BT over the interests of the pension scheme members? If not, it was not necessary to determine the lawfulness of any of BT's proposals. That approach was reflected in the, in the November submission. It sought the Chief Secretary's answer to that logically anterior policy question. The Chief Secretary's answer was that, that BT's interests should not be preferred in the manner they proposed. Now, it's also incorrect for Ms Rose to say that issue one results from some kind of late vault fast on the part of the government. That's simply not fair. And I want to show you the response um, in the government's answer to BT's pre-action protocol letter in the second supplementary bundle. Behind tab 29... And if you could turn, first of all, to page 323, um, you see letter heading C and paragraph 12, this frames the response. So this is BT's contention that the Treasury should have implemented the workaround. This is, this is it's, it's paraphrasing the contention in its pre-action protocol letter. And three answers are given as to why this is incorrect. And if you turn on to the next page, page 324, thirdly, in any case, even on BT's own case, an amend amendment to the PCSPS rules would not necessarily result in the Section B members having no entitlements, and this position would result in legal uncertainty. It was for this reason that BT considered that the statutory override address below was necessary. And so you can see that this wasn't a vault pass just before the hearing. Uh, the government had squarely put that point in response to BT's pre-action protocol letter. I'm so sorry, that's, um, we're, we're, it's page 324. Yes, yeah, so it's paragraph 16. Now, I don't ask you to turn it up, but just for the court's note, it's also reflected at paragraphs 91 to 92 of the government's detailed grounds of resistance. And the reference is core bundle tab 9, page 270. Uh, 92 and... Uh, 91 and 92, my lord. Now, another point put by Ms Rose relates to the resubmission just before the <coughs> proceedings below to the Chancellor. And so she says, well, if it wasn't clear to the government before that we were seeking the workaround as an independent option, it would have been clear at that stage. But we say that's a bad point, because what BT were challenging was the original decision. And the purpose of the resubmission to the Chancellor was simply to ask the Chancellor whether... Once the legal advice had been corrected, because um, the court would have seen from yesterday that although the correct legal advice was given to the Chief Secretary, it was summarised incorrectly to the Chancellor. So the limited purpose of the resubmission was to put the corrected summary of the legal advice to the Chancellor and ask whether the original decision would have been any different. So there was no... It wasn't... The, the, the government, the Treasury wasn't purporting at that stage to retake the decision... What it was faced with was a challenge to its original decision. <coughs> so, my lords, my lady, in conclusion on ground one, we say that BT's consultation response was a detailed and carefully calibrated document which unambiguously sought the statutory override as a necessary part of any solution. And the government, unsurprisingly, understood precisely what BT were asking for. <coughs> 
and that's supported by the contemporaneous documents. And on ground two, we say that the government had a freestanding policy reason for rejecting BT's proposals, and we see um, them proceed deliberately in two stages. It was only if the ministers didn't agree with the recommendation to reject the proposals on policy grounds that the subsequent legal issues then arose. And those are my submissions on grounds one and two. And I propose now, unless the court has any questions, to, to turn to ground three, which is statutory construction. Now, we say that the divisional court was correct to hold that the workaround would have been ultra vires, and we rely fully on the reasons of the court below set out to paragraphs 137 to 157 of the judgment. And the starting point is the increases legislation itself. So could I ask the court to turn up the first authorities bundle? And I'm going to start with the 1971 Act, which is behind tab two. to note section 2, so this was later repealed, but it's relevant for a reason I'm going to explain in a moment, but if, if the court notes in paragraph, in, sorry, in section 2.1 on the second page, um, the increase that is required by section 2 only arises if the cost of living has risen by 4% or more. Does the court see that? That's in subsection 1. Sorry, oh, um... So, my Lord, I'm behind tab 2. I'm on the pension in Pensions oh, Increase sorry, Act, two, 1971. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm looking at section 2, which is on the second page, yes, page 4, sorry, and it's section 2.1. And the point that I'm seeking to make is that the is to note is that the increase that's required at that stage by Section 2 applies only if the cost of living has risen by 4% or more. So if it hasn't risen by that amount, there's no obligation to make any uh, provision. Now, this has been replaced by the provisions in the 1975 Act, which I'm going to come to. But it's important in my submission to have regard to it because it was in force before the Superannuation Act of 1972, which is relied on by BT. And so what one sees is that there was already a detailed provision for indexation, which contained this specific restriction. And that was there on the statute book before the Superannuation Act came into force. And we say that it's inconsistent with there being a general and unrestricted power in the 1972 Superannuation Act to make provision for increases to protect against the cost of living. It's inconsistent to read the 1972 Act as conferring those general powers in a context where there was already, the year before, a specific statute which provided for increases only in particularly restrictive circumstances. Now, moving on to section 59, <coughs> which is behind tab 5. I'm just trying to understand that submission. Um, and I'm not quite sure what you're saying there. So th this, is dealing with, so I'm just, this is dealing with the um, public sector employees. Yes. And you're saying that there's a specific provision under this legislation, which comes before the 1972 Act. Yes. And it only provides for increases if the cost of living is risen by 4% or more. So yes. Are you saying that if there was a rise of less than 4%, nobody would get anything? More? Yes, that's, that's what this provides. So looking on the face of this Act, that's what it provides. That's in 1971. That's the effect of Section 2. And so what I'm saying is it's part of a broader point I'm going to be making about the construction of the 1972 Act. But what Miss Rose says is that the 1972 Act is in very general terms. 
and it permits increases for indexation. You may be right about that. Are you, uh, you're saying that with great conviction. That's that it's the, the proposition slightly surprises me that if there were, there were cost of living increases of 1, 2 or 3 percent, there was no mechanism at all by which public sector employees could get it. Maybe there was a stat provision requiring you have to get it after 4 percent, but I find, I don't know what the answer is, but I find that proposition slightly surprising. Well, I think my, my junior, Mr Halliday, tells me that there is a um, catch-up provision in Section 2. So if there is, um, so going back to Section 2, that I think um, that what, this, what the rest of this provides is that if there's an accumulation, um, then there could, there's some sort of catch-up. I don't know exactly how it works, but I, I will come back. And, um, just, I, I don't know the answer, but no. I, I find the proposition a little surprising. Well, my Lord, there's an awful lot of sector, I'm sure, as well. I mean, <laughs> the, one would really have to read the whole of it very carefully before yes. being completely clear what it is that it's doing. Well, my Lord, also, 4% of the 1970s was the age of hyperinflation. Yes. 4% yes. was next to nothing. <laughs> my Lord, that's a fair, that is a yeah. fair point. But can, okay, can, I, can I then put the submission this way, which is that... Um, my, my submission is going to be, and I don't need to rely on Section 2 to make this submission, but my submission is that, um, that, that Section 59 does provide a specific bespoke scheme for making increases. And to construe the 1972 Act in the way that Ms Rose suggests I'm going to be submitting would cut across that. And the reason that I referred, so to put the submission in context, the reason I referred to Section 2 of the 1971 Act is it throws up in sharp relief because there is that restriction. The difficulty in interpreting a subsequent wider power in a way which undercuts the restrictions in this bespoke statutory regime, that's my submission. I don't need to rely on Section 2. I mean, the difficulty is in this area of, of pensions rights, which is notoriously difficult and complicated, is difficult to excavate uh, 30 or 40 years later. That's the point. Well, that's a fair point. So let, let me make the submissions by reference to Section 59, because it's the same submission. It's really not central <coughs> to, to, to my overall submission on statutory construction. But I think you, you don't dispute that Sections 1... Sections 1 and 2 of the 1972 Act are phrased in extremely broad and general terms. They're extremely broad and general, that's correct. And one of the purposes must have been, surely, as Ms. Rose submitted, to replace the piecemeal provision made by a number of different statutes for different types of um, public sector pension schemes yes. with a unifying range of enabling powers, which would enable a much more sense more centralised and sensible approach to be taken for the future. I do accept that, my Lord, but, but my submission is that, um, that, that they can't be, they're not, Parliament did not intend those wide powers to be used for this purpose, because, no, well, because there's a specific statutory scheme in place. My Lord, can I develop my submissions, because I, I do need to grapple with the point that my Lord's putting, yeah. but can I take it, yeah. can I take it sequentially? Um, but but, but I, I do, I recognise I have to grapple with that point, but... Um, starting with um, section 59 behind tab 5. <coughs> so the court's seen this, it's on page 35. And um, what this, to recap, what this does is mandates that an official pension, and that's the entirety of the official pension, be increased by a specified percentage. Does my Lord have that? So we're on page 35. So it's a mandatory provision, and it relies, it refers to the whole of an official pension, and it requires that it be increased by a specific percentage, and that specific percentage we see in 591A is the same percentage as that contained in... Um, a relevant direction made under Section 151 of the Administration Act. And you see the words, the same percentage. And so, regardless of the fact that GMP, that the GMP element 
of the official pension is being indexed elsewhere, that's a point I'm going to come to, pursuant to other statutory provisions, so notably section 109. Parliament has nonetheless provided in this statute, in section 59.1, that the entirety of the pension must be increased by this percentage, including the GMP element. So that is the, that is the fundamental statutory obligation. And then what we see in section 59.5 over the page is a recognition of the fact that the GMP element of the pension may well be the subject of indexation by other means. And that's why it provides for a switch off to that extent, because... It, it, it seeks to avoid the overriding uh, fundamental obligation is that in 59.1, which is a specific uprate, the specific a particular percentage. But if, that's in, if that for the GMP element is being provided under section 109, for example, then this statute does not want double indexation. And so it switches off to that extent the indexation um, that's being carried out in relation to the GMP. But what it does, what we see from section 59.5, is that it, it plainly contemplates and acknowledges the fact that the GMP may be uprated via some other specific statutory provision. And we know that the way that that's done is via section 109, or in, in previous years, via the AP. And then we have, in section 59A... Yes, the date, for, uh, the date this Act came into force, section 109 lay long in the future, so it was the, the AP would have been the way this was done, is that right? That's correct, my lord, yes. And, so, and, and then... It's not that it may be, I think the assumption behind it is that it is... Yes, exactly, my lord, yes. It must no, have been, it, it, it must have been something increasing, so it must have been the AP. Yes, that's right. Um, and then, my lord, turning to page 38, one sees there, um, this is the last part at the top of the page of section 59.7. This, this section and section 59A of this Act, and do, do you have that? So I'm looking at page 38 at the very top of the page. And just tracking back what this is, you can see on page 37 that we're on to subsection 7. So we're on section 59.7, and it says in this section. And then over the page... Wait, 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 sorry. Where does subsection... Yes, I got, I got 7, yes. Where does 7 begin? Like? It begins, my lord, on page 37. Do you see just above in the second... Yes. Def this is a definition. Yes, got it, thank you. Um, and then over the page, the last bit, just before subsection 8... And this section and section 59A of this Act and the said Act of 1971 shall have effect as if this section and section 59A of this Act were contained in part one of that Act, i.e. the 1971 Act. So what's being specifically, what Parliament's providing for expressly here is that section 59 and 59A are deemed to be in the 1971 Act and therefore predate the 1972 Superannuation Act. And then you have, of course, <coughs> section 59A on page 43. Well, what's the purpose of that? I mean, that's like, why, 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 why is there that? And you say that's the effect of it, but why, why should they have done that? Well, what we say that it makes it makes clear that so can I put the point this way? We say that um, had had the if the superannuation act were to be read as Miss Rose contends as containing broad powers to, um, to to go beyond she, the way she put it is that this sets a floor and under the 1972 Act, more generous provision can be made for specific schemes. If that were correct, 
we say that one would expect to see, because this legislation was enacted after the 1972 Act, one would expect to see in section 59, in the section 59 scheme, a recognition of the fact that this is a minimum uh, and sets a floor and that there are powers already on the statute book that may permit more to be given. And one doesn't see that at all. So what one sees um, instead is this, the specification of a precise amount. And now returning to my Lady, Lady Justice Davies question, um, it is important that this is deemed to be, uh, to take effect from 1971. Because what Parliament is saying is that here we have, in my submission, a, a specific statutory scheme which has been enacted after the 1972 Act, which contains these general powers which we all know about and which overhauls the system in the way that, that Ms Rose contended. But we are nonetheless amending the 1971 bespoke statutory scheme and this shall take effect, deemed to be as though it were um, enacted at that point. I the answer might be if you ever had it a book on pensions law from 19, from, 19, from this, the date of this act, 1975. It probably do exist, those, that, that will probably explain the reason for it. I know what you say the effect is, Yes. but, but you're guessing, if I may say so, of what the reason is. Well, my lord, whatever the reason, I, 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 it does, that's a fair point. So my lord, it's a fair point that my lord puts, which is that I am, in answer to, to, to my lady's question, engaging in some degree of speculation as to why this was done the way it was done. But what we do know is that this is the upshot. And the upshot of this is that you have a specific regime which is deemed to apply from 1971. And the specific regime says nothing about this is only a minimum. In fact, on the contrary, what it does is sets a specific percentage. It is intended and does on its face apply to the whole of the pension, of the official pension. And we say that, it, that, that if uh, Miss Rose were right and the wide powers, not intended for this purpose, much wider powers, um, were to be construed as permitting different provisions to be made, that would cut across the mandatory provisions of this scheme. And, and that's, that's, in a nutshell, what we say in response to the statutory construction point. So, uh, viewing these provisions together, so, so the Section 59 scheme, Section 59 and Section 59A, um, we have a specified increase, as I've said, applying to the whole of the pension, um, which expressly recognises that the GMP element um, may be indexed elsewhere, but which overall requires that the price percentage increase is applied and that there is no double indexation, see section 59.5, and no shortfall, say, see section 59A. But the consequence, as I understand it, that, that the consequence of that submission is that there, there, you're saying there is effectively, Parliament has prevented government, if it wished to do so, for whatever its reasons, to award more than that percentage. That seems a very strange proposition to me. Well, my Lord, we say not a strange proposition. And, and again, um, my Lord's going to accuse me of engaging in speculation, but just to test why, why, why that may not be a strange <coughs> proposition. One can quite see in fiscal terms why it might be um, desirable for pension schemes to be set up and managed for, for different sectors by different ministers. But that in terms of the serious fiscal consequences of uprating, this should be something determined centrally for all pension schemes. And one can quite see why that's not, that's not an, an absurd um, result for Parliament to have, um, to, to, to have um, yes. determined. Okay. So, submission's clear. So, we do rely on, in support of our submission, we do rely on... Um, the canon of construction in Benyon. In fact, we say this is a paradigm case of, uh, 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 of, the, of that um, <coughs> canon being uh, applied. And if we could just turn up the relevant section of Benyon in the second authorities bundle behind tab 58. 
Ah, I've got the wrong reference. Um, oh no, it's the right reference. I apologise. So this is on page 1755. And you see there, towards the top of the page, section 88, Generalia Specialibus Non Derogant. And then where the literal meaning... Does the court have that? Page 1755. Where the literal meaning of a general enactment covers a situation for which specific provision is made by another enactment contained in an earlier act. And we say, whatever the reason, this is an earlier act because it's deemed to be... <coughs> It is presumed that the situation was intended to continue to be dealt with by the specific provision rather than the later general one. Accordingly, this, the earlier specific provision is not treated as impliedly repealed. And then we have further down, I'm not going to read it out, but a, an excerpt from the Vera Cruz case that was referred to below. Now... What Miss Rose contended yesterday was that uh, she referred to Lord Newberger in CUSAC um, as authority for the proposition that it's only where there's a conflict between statutory provisions that this canon of construction applies. But we say that that's not so. And if one looks at CUSAC, which is behind tab 43 of the same bundle. And in particular, go to paragraph 61 on page 1179. So this is Q's which one? one um, page 1179, paragraph 61, my lord. So this is the... Tab which tab? Uh, tab 43. So the, the reason why the principle um, did not apply in that case was not because Lord Newberger says it only applies where there's a conflict. He said that it's because he doesn't think it's possible to treat Section 66.2 as a specific provision in contrast with Section 81 as the more general provision. They are simply different provisions concerned with overlapping aims and with overlapping applications. And we see there why he said that, because both of these provisions, and we see this from, from paragraph 62, each provision authorises a highway authority to erect posts, in the case of section 66, to safeguard persons using the highway, and the case of section 80, for the purpose of, of, of preventing access to a highway. So he's saying, well, there's not one that's more general and one that's more specific. And that's why the maximum, maximum didn't apply, or the principle didn't apply. But we say contrast this case where there is a specific provision as compared with the general powers in the 1972 Act. My Lord, I see the time. Is that a convenient yeah. moment? Yes, I mean, what occurs to me is, and I know you're pitching to this, uh, this ground three, but, of course, in a way, it's quite a difficult task to reach this sort of conclusion. It may be appropriate on particular facts, and you say these are particular <coughs> facts. But it, it's quite a... Uh, when you have provisions which on the face of them are wide, and they relate to the general subject matter and issue, it is quite a strong thing for a court to say, uh, particularly in the case of government uh, action, that you know, it simply precludes the government doing something which would be, in addition, more generous, in this case, to members than, than would be permitted. In a way... However, what you're saying uh, is leading into perhaps more promising territory, which is can you actually use one act to overcome yes. the effect of another? That's a slightly different proposition, yes. which is use one act which in effect, albeit not directly, removes a benefit that would otherwise be applied. That's a, I would have thought that was a more promising pro I'm not saying it's a successful proposition, but it strikes me for what it's worth as a slightly more promising one. My Lord, I'm grateful. But can I just end then um, by, by saying this, that what BT is seeking to do in this case is not, of course, to persuade the government to provide more, not, of course, to persuade the government to provide more generous provision for a particular scheme, but to do exactly what the specific statutory regime I think that's is. what I'm saying to you. That seems yes. a more promising approach. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, may I just add one like, yes. question? <laughs> 
this is perhaps a problem with the old submission that the 1971 Act itself has now been repealed. It's no longer on the statute book. So the, the reading back of 59 and 59A of the 1971 Act is, so to speak, my Lord, I think the answer to that, but can I, can I come back to it? Can I I'll double check over the lunchtime adjournment? I think the answer is that only certain provisions were repealed, the rest of the Act stays. And so if I might just briefly deal with it, the, the, the answer is that um, the 1975 Act repeals Section 1 of the 1971 Act. There are other provisions in the 71 Act, like qualifying <coughs> conditions, two, two, 1 and 2. Section 2, it's like, bigger part, and it repealed Section 2 of the 1971 Act. Then in Section 59.7, it said that the, the new bits that come from the 75 Act are to be read back together with the 71 Act, the rest of the 71 Act. <laughs> I'm not sure where that leaves us, except from the state of confusion. But. Anyway, the um, main thing is, uh, we've come to that. How are you doing with your submission? Because you, you, obviously you have been moving quite swiftly. Yes, I, I think... How are you doing? I've promised to finish by 3.15 or shortly earlier, and I think that should be... You're on, you're on course. I'm on course. Very good indeed. Uh, five past two. Good